Hello, today is December 18th, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we're privileged to have with us Richard Doran, D-O-R-A-N. Hi, Dick, thank you for coming today. Hi, Joan. May I ask you where and when you were born? Yes, I was born at the Leonard Morris Hospital of Natick, 19, uh, November 1927. And where did you grow up in Natick? I grew up you know, first on Reynolds Avenue uh, in Natick, then over in uh, East Natick in the Grove section. For I was there until I lived there until I got married in 1950. I have then, uh, we rented houses up here in, in the center of town for a few years, and then we moved to Framingham on our first uh, house in, um, I'm guessing, 19, probably 55. Lived there for about 10 years, and we moved back to Natick in 1965. What was Natick like when you were growing up? It was a, a, a sort of an idealistic community in that you knew so many people. Um, my father being belonging to the Legion, my mother working for the Red Cross. She was the executive secretary for the Red Cross. We had a lot of contact with people in the town. And it was a very homey kind of a t an atmosphere. Uh, the schools were small. There were the number of students in the school was small. Well, the whole town was just small and comfortable. And it was rather idyllic, and especially it was idyllic when our kids were starting to grow up. Uh, for them, they got, a, I think, a good base. Plus, we were a part of St. Patrick's Church community, and so we pretty much stayed everything in here in this town. And how many children do you have? I have three children. I have two boys and a girl. And do you have any grandchildren? I have two grandchildren, and I have a half a great-grandchild. Where and when did you enter the military? I enlisted in the Navy in 1945, uh, and I served in the Navy in 1945 until you know, the late summer of 1946 when they separated me. So you entered from Boston, and why did you join at that time? Uh, probably principally because I was probably close to being uh, called for a draft, so rather than the draft, I chose to volunteer for the Navy um, a romantic, if nothing else, uh, idea as far as the Navy itself is concerned. As far as, I'm sorry? Well, well, a little more romantic, I guess, than carrying a rifle. So you thought? Yes. And when you volunteered for the Navy, how long a time would you be going into the Navy? Well, at the time, they were having people serve for the duration of the war, plus six months. And so I was in for probably a year and a half altogether. And when you, did you also, in looking over some of your information, you mentioned you also chose the Navy because of being at sea? I anticipated that I would be at sea, uh, but the Navy saw it different during the uh, time that they had me in for the, uh, during the Second World War. Okay, we'll, go, we'll get into that in a okay. minute. Um, did any of your family or friends join when you did or around the time? Well, they were in prior to, I'm the baby of the family, so I was the last one in. My older brother uh, had been in the Navy since 1943, well, and he was serving in the Pacific for three years. And my next uh, older brother, well, was drafted into the Army in 1944, and he served for about a year and a half. And then I joined the uh, Navy subsequent to that. And you had other relatives also that joined? Oh, yeah, cousins, um, mostly just cousins that had joined either the, the Navy or the Army, one of the two. I don't recall what their status was as, as to the when. I, cu I couldn't give you any kind of dates. And they all came home? Fortunately, they all survived and came home, yes. Now, with the Navy, did you have a basic training? Yes. And ba where was that? Ba Bainbridge, Maryland. 
Had you been out of Natick in your youth? Was this a new adventure for you, or had you traveled before? Well, I had no foreign travel before, and I say we lived on the water because it seemed like every weekend my father was anxious to get down to Lynn Beach or Rivera Beach or Old Orchard or whatever, and we spent a lot of time at the salt water, at the beach somewhere. Um, as far as any distance is concerned, uh, back then, uh, with a limited income, my father couldn't afford to go any place with us, so that we just mostly did camping, tenting at these, some of these locations. And how many children were in your family total? Just three of us. three boys. Together, three what boys. did your father do? My father was the um, supervisor, supervisor of a uh, distillery warehouse over in South Boston on D Street, uh, Pilgrim, Pilgrim, Felton's, Felton's Distilleries. Felton's Distilleries. Yeah. Um, tell us, getting back to your basic training in Bainbridge, Maryland, what was it that you, what was it like for you? Different, to say the least, being snatched, snatched out of a community such as we have here in a, in a home and uh, brought into this community of several hundred or a thousand or more uh, other men, if we can use that term at that juncture, we, I wasn't sure that we were men, but anyhow, that's what they called us. And uh, we served, uh, well, they, the basic training was supposed to be about six weeks. Um, I served four of those six weeks, and they called me down to Washington, D.C., so I didn't quite finish all of it with the group that I started with. Now, why did they call you to Washington, D.C.? Well, they had a, an assignment for me down in Arlington, Virginia, and I did some traveling. It was a special assignment. And what was that assignment? Well, according to my personnel record, it's uh, Bureau of Personnel. But was it something else? Yeah. And are you at liberty to talk about that? No. Was it top secret? Semi, yeah. Did you have classification? Yes, top. What was... Was it because you had specialty in your background or came bubbled to the top in some of your basic training? Well, I guess through some interviews that they have they give you in the Navy, they were apparently impressed enough with what my background was uh, and what I had to offer them so that they selected me and pulled me out of the basic training group. How old were you at that time? 17. Excuse me, 17. And what kind of background? Well, I had had some uh, training as far as accounting was concerned, uh, business office operations, and uh, they apparently felt that that had an advantage to them. I was also very active in various civic organizations, Boy Scouts, and uh, a few uh, things that I did volunteering, and they just apparently uh, liked what I had to offer. So you were in, I'm sorry, Virginia? You mentioned? Arlington, Virginia, just across the, uh, the river from Washington. And how long were you in Arlington? See, I lived in Arlington in a house for about seven months, and then they finally had cleared out a, a, a barracks, what they call Quarters K, and we lived there in barracks for the remainder of the time before I was discharged, about being another three or four, about four months. So you spent your time during 1945 for 40. about a year and a half. You spent it in? Yeah. in wa well, I was based out of Washington. Based out of Washington. Basically, yeah. And you were then eventually in a barracks with some of your peers that worked with yes. you. And when you when you were in Arlington, did you have a, a, an office? I reported to an office, yes. And is it in a building that is currently? Bureau of Personnel. Bureau of Personnel. Or as they like to refer to it, Bupers. The Navy is great for. Uh, initials. And what were the initials? Bupers. B-U-P-E-R-S. Did you maintain friendships with the group that you were with? Well, we were pretty scattered, but yeah, I did. I had one fellow that traveled with me a lot. We maintained relationship um, all the, during the time that we were in. 
And we did afterwards, um, after I left the Navy, I had seen him several times. He came from uh, Milwaukee, and uh, as a matter of fact, he came out, came out just prior to my getting married. And uh, so we kept up correspondence for a while, but then after a while, it just kind of faded away. So but you the, don't know if he's still... I have no idea of his existence. So without delving into any of the secretive information, can you tell us what your day was like? Wow. Um, mostly rather lengthy. I spent a lot of time in railroad stations and on trains and in some cities, uh, mostly it's all on the East Coast. And it was a lot of traveling back and forth mostly. And then there would be periods uh, when there wasn't anything traveling to do when that's the office. And at the time, uh, the Navy was rather big on IBM. And so they brought me in for training on IBM machines. These, back then it was pretty crude when I think, when I think about it now, with what we have, uh, because we mostly were operating with IBM cards. Now, this was in the 50s. Not in the yeah, 40s. No, 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 this was in the 40s. In the 40s, oh, yeah. they had IBM back then, yeah. too. Yeah, they had key punch and verifiers and the sorters, and these were all to do with the, what they, in the Navy they call them the personnel jackets. And these jackets travel with you if you change stations. They, it's a whole compilation of all that you have done while you're in the service. And we had to go through and do a lot of editing and massaging of these records uh, for the Navy and then they eventually were just put in storage and they had this huge building, this Bupers, a Bureau of Personnel building where they had a lot of file drawers and file cabinets uh, which today could all be put into oh, probably a bookcase. Because it's all now? It's all so small now, everything is so tiny. Mm -hmm. But then there was a tremendous amount of paper. You could, you know, they had records of people going back dozens of years. Could I, could I assume, rightfully or not, that being at railroad stations and cities and traveling, that perhaps you did a little courier type of work? Well, yeah, I suppose you could call it that somewhat. This is rather intriguing, you know. <laughs> is there any point in time where you think you can talk about some of the work that you've done? No, for the most part, my records have been, all of my records have been expunged and it only uh, lists me as being in the Bureau of Personnel. Mm -hmm. This was at the request, yeah, that most of us asked for that to be done. And did you work a normal nine to five work day? No. Uh, as Mr. Jones in the Army used to say that this was the Army and there's some guy up there blowing a bugle at Reveille. Well, first you get shot him, and then you shot the guy that woke him up. <laughs> uh, far from it, because there were some times when it was sleeping over in, in a railroad station. Mm -hmm. Very uncomfortable. When you were um, traveling, were you in uniform? Always. What rank were you at this point in time? The only rank that I had was uh, seaman first class, which would be comparable, I suppose, to a corporal. The, the ratings were insignificant. Now, after about a year and a half, you said you were then... We were separated. Separated, discharged. Um, yeah, we went back to Bainbridge, Maryland, where we were started our indoctrination, and they separated us there and sent us home. And you came home to Natick? Yes. And when you came home, did you work or? I went back to finish high school. Oh, so you had left when you were still in high school. Yeah. What prompted you to do that? What, go back? What prompted you to leave high school? At that, at that age, school, school really did, wasn't that important to us. Was it because you were interested in what was happening? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In World War II? Yes, being a, a boy, if you will. There was a certain amount of romance with, <coughs> excuse me, with the military in war. So you, you went back to school as a senior? or Yes, as a senior. Was that difficult, getting back into the classroom? No, not really. Uh, I somewhat embraced it because I saw instances in the Navy where men 
had not received education. At that time, they didn't offer the GED that they do now, and um, they suffered to a certain extent, probably socially, and I think there was a little bit of um, uh, difficulty for them to intermix and to socialize because of lack of education. I mean, I, I, there were kids that we always used to joke about that they didn't have shoes until they came into the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, but truthfully, we, this is when you were that, in that atmosphere, I suppose that was not too unseemly. Um, but it's just that I saw the advantages of education. And as a matter of fact, I didn't stop learning or going to school until, nine, until 2002 when they finally, um, I got through working and retired. And you were still in, taking some classes? Somewhere, sometime, something. somewhere during the year, taking classes in Georgia, Florida, Missouri, Detroit, New Jersey, you name it. So it, the, the education has been constant. So what year did you officially graduate from Natick High School? Let's see, was it 46? Officially, I graduated in 47. But you were probably with other students who were not initially in your class? Yeah, my class was a class of 46, mm -hmm. and they had already graduated while I was uh, in the Navy. So I came back the next year and uh, finished up. And do you feel, as you said, you knew the importance. Do you feel that you were better academically once you went back than when you left? Yes. Mm -hmm. And socially as well, uh, besides the academia, I got a lot. I think I was a little bit more mature than when I had left, mm -hmm. needless to say. I had some other experiences of life. And having graduated then, did you go into the workforce or did you go to well, school? Well, I've been into the workforce constantly. I started by digging peat uh, on a florist down in Route 9, in what they call the Sunkaway. Do you remember the name of the florist? No, I don't. He's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. But he had, he, I was digging peat for 10 cents an hour. And then I had other menial jobs. I went to work for Barbara, not Barbara, but uh, Bar Florist on the South Natick for a couple of years. I worked for Evergood Cold Stone, Evergood Food Store here in Natick. Now, where was Evergood Food Store? Right up here on uh, West Central Street, right underneath the Legion Hall. There was a food store there. Yeah, Evergood. So that Coastal we're Evergood. talking one, Route 135. Yeah. And then after that, I went to a, an outfit up here on North Main. Uh, that used to, that's not there anymore. That's where there's a pizza parlor and a gas station now. But uh, they were meat processing pretty much. They make dog food. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of the outfit. But I was a truck driver for them, driving in and out of Boston. And after that, let me see what I'm. Uh, then I went to work at for the uh, railroad, the South Station and the railroad for about maybe. Well, I did some after school and then summer work there. So this is all prior to turning 20? Yeah. Busy Berry. And then I went to work. The last place I worked for before they I turned was um, the Electric Time Company. It used to be up on Union Street. In Natick? Yeah. Yeah, everything, most everything in this is, is Natick, except for the working for the South Station. So where on Union Street was the electric? There now were some condos that's um, maybe a quarter of a mile, not even about a tenth of a mile up the street on Union from uh, East Central. And that was, I got laid off then. Of course, this was the, just before the second time in. And we might want to mention that you were requested to to. I got rejoin. a letter from Harry, yeah. Harry Truman. Truman. Right. Welcome. And what year was that? That was 1951, so Christmas present. Were you surprised to get that letter? Yeah, uh, very much so. I had only been married a little over a year, about a year and two or three months. Now, did you marry a local girl? At the time, she was local. Uh, she was originally um, brought up in Cambridge, and she lived in Cambridge and Belmont and um, they moved here 
oh, I don't know exactly when, but it was about a, she, I think, finished her junior and senior year here in college and in school. Um, we, bo we both met when we were both in the same homeroom when I, remember, when I returned. At the high school. At the high school, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get this letter in 1951, you're newly married. Was it a mandate was that a, you join? Meaning, was it that you had no choice or did you have I had no choice. It was either that or go to jail. Okay. Okay. That was the option that we had when you were signed into the service. And when you, where did you have to um, report? Fargo Building in South Boston. And from there, where did you go? Onto the USS Baltimore Heavy Cruiser. CA-68. Now talk about that. What is a heavy cruiser? Heavy cruiser as opposed to a light cruiser. This heavy cruiser, which was built in uh, Fort River Shipyard in, that started in 1943 and finished in 1944, served in the Pacific, came back off the Pacific, was sent to Bremerton, Washington, and was mothballed for a few years. When the hostilities broke out, uh, in Korea, they demothballed it, sent it over here to Boston. Uh, they put it in dry dock. They stripped everything off of it as far as you know, everything that would be removable, all fresh paint, all provision. And then they started to crew up. And th th this ship, when it was launched, had uh, nine uh, big rifles, 10 inch, what we call rifles in the Navy. They were cannons. And they had three turrets, and then they had six five inch. Uh, dual five-inch uh, rifles, and then they had uh, eight what they call Quad 40 anti-aircraft guns, plus torpedoes, um, that was about it. And they carried a crew back during the World War II of about 12, 1,400 men. But when they came out of Boston, uh, when, they, when, we over, over t when we sailed on it this time, the last time, they had about 900 men. So Which, twelve to fourteen hundred in World War Two, yeah, um, and nine hundred when we went to uh, off the Korean War. So did you know when you were assigned that you would be heading out to? Didn't have the foggiest because I came into the Fargo building, what they used to call the Fargo barracks, and uh, I gave them the information. They said, "Okay, go down and get your uniforms that you need. You're going to get an assignment." And I after about. Three or four days, they gave me papers and they said, go down to the Army base. There's a ship down there waiting for you. Did you know any of your shipmates? Absolutely nobody. So this is all brand new to you. Most of these fellows on the ship, when they got into here in Boston, all, most of them came from the west coast or the south. We had a detachment of Marines on board. They all came from the California boot camp, the Marine boot camp. They were about 70, 60 or 70 of those guys. The other ones were mostly young recruits out of boot camp. They called me Pop. And how old were you, about 22? 25, 25, 24, 25, something like that. 25 years old. And yeah. they, so you were the older Yeah, yeah I, was one of, I was among the senior of the groups. Yeah. And you didn't have to have a refresher class for boot camp no, or anything like no, that? nothing. No, they just put me right on board. And were you, because this was different than your first go around where you were on land, was this exciting to you, or did you were you upset because you had to leave? What were your feelings? Yes, yes, I was. I, I did get pleasure, but I was upset because I left my wife at home. Was she going to be with family while you were away? Or was no, she, she was living. Well, she her mother lived with her for a while, so she wasn't totally alone. But after a while, she had spent most of her time alone. She was working. And what had you heard about the Korean conflict? Only what they broadcast on the media. Uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot that you could hear because they were very careful about the information that they released. And so I had no concept of where we were going until I got on board ship. And then when we found out where we were going, I didn't have the concern. And where exactly were you going? what they call a Sixth Fleet, which is the Mediterranean. They call it the American Lake. And how long did it take you to get there? I'd say about 10 days. We ran into a terrible storm up in the North Atlantic. 
Just being very high winds, high waves. And we were in a, we had to join up with the squad and we left here alone. We left Boston alone. There was nobody with us, no other ship with us. And we joined up with a squadron that had already been forming up when we got out there. Uh, two aircraft carriers, two cruisers, uh, four destroyers, five destroyer escorts, and one submarine. And we all gathered within a, a specific area for uh, sailing into the Mediterranean. What was it like for you and your shipmates during the storm? Well, it wasn't too bad. I didn't mind it at all. As a matter of fact, the only time I had any queasiness at all, in all the time I've spent on the water, in yachts and boats and even on this big ship, uh, I had a little queasiness going out of Boston Harbor. Uh, they always leave a box of crackers around some location on board ship. And you uh, delve into this box of crackers and you swallow some of them. It gives you something in your belly. Then I went out on deck for about 20 minutes, and then I came back in, and that was the last time I ever had any kind of indication that I would might be a little bit uh, queasy being in the ocean. Even under the hurricane, uh, it wasn't a hurricane, but it was about 70, 80 knot winds out there in the ocean. There were about 40 or 50 foot swells. Um, you, some of the boats went down into a trough in the ocean. You couldn't even see them until they came back up on the other side. And when they made a turn and they get the, you with the Gulf of the Leeward side, and the stats, the boat starts going over to one side. They have up on the bridge, they have an inclinometer. The inclinometer registers how far over the ship has gone. And um, it ran out of the gauge because it just went over so far. And, and it, it was rough for a while, but and I think they broke every coffee cup on the ship. All ended up as broken china. Little things like that. So once you got to the Mediterranean, what did you do? I spent some time, they needed me for uh, what they call a combat information net to record messages coming over the net. And then they wanted me to get some training also for radar. So I spent uh, several weeks um, training for different aspects of radar as far as the combat information center was concerned. And the, the commander, <coughs> excuse me, of the communication section, which is what I was in, I was going through apparently my dossier and he wanted me uh, to do other than just the radar and the communication. So he, he brought me into the combination, the, what they call the CIC office, which was below deck. And uh, he wanted me to uh, go through the duties that had to be done on that. But it was a lot of administrative duties that we were doing. Uh, and then he also, I had to, I was the cop captain's talker whenever we had anything like general quarters or reprovisioning or any kind of activity where the captain was on the bridge and we had to communicate between vessels, I would be his talker up on the bridge. So I spent a lot of time up there with the captain. What and was the captain like? We had two captains. Um, when we left Boston, we had a captain by the name of Fonville Lee Tedder, uh, an old Southern gentleman, World War II veteran. He was the, uh, what they call, Com crew de pack. That's an, a fancy, a quick way of putting it. He was the commander of the destroyer division of the Pacific Fleet. And he left there as he promoted out of the, of the Pacific as a captain. And he got the ship, the Baltimore. And about halfway through our tour of duty over in the Mediterranean, they had what they call a change of command. And we had a second captain uh, who came on board. Never got to really got to know the second captain. I can't even remember his name at this point. Uh, I wasn't too impressed with him, and I don't think he was too impressed with me. But in any event, the other, the first one we had, this Captain Tedder, was a very nice guy. Um, spent a lot of time with him. He's an excellent sailor. I loved to be on the bridge with him because he could um, navigate the ship, and he knew the speed of the ship, the, the wind, the wind wave, excuse me, the wind direction, the wind speed. Uh, currents. I mean, he knew everything without even looking at any paper. He could sit in his chair up there on the flying bridge and know all of these things. 
And that was impressive to me. How long were you on the ship? Until I got off. But, uh, see, we came back about, about October, I guess, of 1940, excuse me, no, 52, 53, October 53. So in that time period, did you, did you have any direct combat with any? Groups? No, we, the, the Mediterranean was, like, like I said, the American lake. Uh, we had problems, not problems, we had concerns when we sailed up the Bosporus. Um, and we also had some problems when we sail up by Yugoslavia because at the time they were strict communist countries and we had to go on what they call condition two, which meant, meant that our gun tubs, if you will, were manned and breaches loaded. Because, because, you know, just to expect something might happen. It was just in a case. You know. and, and we lost a couple of people whom we assumed when we pulled into Trieste, uh, we had a couple of uh, people who never came back. We figured that they possibly might have been captured by the, the uh, Russians or somebody, because they were the Russians were all over the place in Trieste. But no direct combat, no shooting. We didn't have any shooting war at all. Now, when you say you lost a few with these um... enlisted personnel, people who were on liberty at the time, and they were traveling around the, the, the city of Trieste. So they were on a, a short leave and then never came back, yeah. and you don't think it, it would have been that they went AWOL or anything like that? Not over in Trieste, not over mm -hmm. in that area, because there was nothing there really for them. That was, Trieste was a difficult city. It was um, claimed by both the communists and the, uh, the Europeans as well. So it was sort of a thing right in the middle. It was always ups and down as to who owned what. And did after the fact, did we ever hear what happened? I never heard to them? anything more. So they were missing in action and never seen again. Either that, or they were they got, got uh, repatriated somehow. And if they did, they must have been assigned to a different duty. So, but we never heard any more about them. So, on a daily basis, you were doing some administrative work and working, as you said, the voice of the captain. Yep. During your free time, what did you do? Study. Uh, for the most part, spent a lot of time in the office when I wasn't on other, any other kind of duty because of a tremendous amount of paperwork. I had to uh, pull out operations orders out of the, uh, the safe, reinterpret them for the people who would be getting copies of them, make copies and distribute them to the various uh, different sections of the ship, the gunnery, engineering, etc. Also, we had to do some learning. I, used to, I did also the one time we had to go on an inspection party from one ship to another. Now there was another cruise in, the, in our squadron that was sailing with us, and they had to have an inspection of their combat information center. And I was uh, selected to go across to that ship, underway by what they call a bosun's chair on a high line. This is where they attach a big rope between ships and you put on this metal, what they call a bosun's chair, and you're hanging up in the air, and they pull you from one ship to the other, and it's about probably 200 yards over the water while the ship is traveling at about 15 knots. And that the idea is uh, not to get wet when you're being pulled across. Well, the guys on the other ship really didn't get the message totally, so they, I got a little dunking, but it wasn't too bad. It was just a uh, a little bit in the bottom. But do you remember the... Oh, vividly, yes. Yeah. Were you a little yeah. nervous about doing this? No, it was exciting that it was happening. I never anticipated that it was that I would be selected to go over. Um, but the officer wanted me, and he went first. Fortunately, he made it, but maybe it's because he was an officer. But he got over there first, and when he saw me, he was laughing like a fool. And the captain came down from the other ship, and he... He apologized and he sent up on some dry clothes and shoes and so forth. And we finished our inspection for about, I guess, six or seven hours. And then we went back the same way. And at that time, I got back dry. But it was, it was quite an experience. Not everybody gets a chance to do it. So I, I have to say, that's, I guess, one of the reasons that I did have a good time doing it. Do you remember um, any other um, 
members of your class or um, neighbors from Natick who also were in the services during the Korean conflict? Did you hear about any of them? Uh, they're all, I do remember uh, Junie Frangios, he was in about the same time, Gordon Channel, who was a police officer in Natick. And uh, I, you know, there's probably a, at least a dozen guys out of my class who went in the service, uh, either they were either drafted or they joined up or something. But I never made much of a point of finding out who or when. I was pretty well self-centered, I guess, at the time. Now, you were in the Mediterranean for how long? Approximately. Two to, two to nine, about seven months. What was your weather like? Well, after we get rid of that storm, it was funny, the, the, the difference. <laughs> when we ran into that storm in the North Atlantic, uh, it was so fierce. In the squadron, we, uh, the, we, were duck, we were what they call the, the, the small boys to the aircraft carrier. The ca aircraft carrier is always supreme. That's where the Admiral is. And anybody else outbound of that is um, d disposable, if you will. And uh, one of the destroyers uh, sailing as what they call small boy to the carrier during the storm called the USS Hobson. Uh, the, when I was sitting down in the combat information center monitoring the radio, and I heard that the the, the carrier gave a direction to the rest of the fleet to make a turn to the right, so many degrees to, to a certain uh, direction, and so everybody is supposed to make this turn. Unfortunately, the, somebody on the Hobson who was ever on the on the bridge made a mistake and they turned left. And when they turned left, the carrier was up on top of a wave and the Hobson came in on the trough and the aircraft carrier came down on top of the Hobson and sunk it. And they lost all but about 15 men because everybody was below deck. As a matter of fact, we had to come back. This was all at night, so we had to come back and try to help get some of the rescues done. But we came back, we saw the carrier. The carrier was crippled because the, the, the destroyer came underneath the keel of the carrier and uh, damaged the rudder. So all they could do was go around in a circle. And uh, when we got there, we saw the, some of the superstructure from the, from the Hobson was sticking up through the flight deck of the carrier. <clears throat> it was a very sad time and it was a very serious time. And later on, when I came home, uh, they announced over the radio and the some of the newspapers of this collision that they had at the sea. And my wife knew that I was in this squadron, but they had no idea who got hit, only that there was a collision at sea when a ship had been sunk. How was that for your wife at that time? It was very, 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 very trying. Um, it was about a week, I guess, before they found out all the details that they needed to know. She was just terribly relieved. She was sorry to hear that the, you know, all those men got lost, but she was glad that uh, just something that didn't happen to me. And then the, the extreme to that, or the antithesis, was when we pulled into the, get through the, the Strait of Gibraltar, it was like a bathtub. And all the time I was there in the Mediterranean, uh, sailing around, there were some windy days, but most of the time it was just idyllic. And uh, in fact, a couple of times the, the, the captain stopped the ship totally, and he put on the, the shock nets, which uh, draped over the side of the ship, and everybody, all the men, unfortunately, with the women on the ship, so it didn't make a difference what they were wearing, if anything at all. They had the swim call, and it's it quite, quite an experience to watch that, too. And um, also, that was, so it was kind of boring to that extent that there was no weather to speak of, except one time I was up on the bridge and the quartermaster came to the captain. He says, according to radar and the information we received, there's a front that we're sailing towards. And he says, well, how can we get by it? He says, yeah, we go to a certain direction. So the captain gave the order to go in a certain direction to try to see if we could avoid that storm. And we saw it coming. I was up on the bridge and I was watching it. And no big thing going on. Guys were working on the deck down below. And it was a rainstorm. It was a sheet of rain that came and split the ship right in the, in the middle, right down the, the, the length of the ship. And I looked down and the starboard side of the ship was bone dry and the, stab, the port side was just drenched in rain. 
And five minutes after we got beyond that point, everything was dry. It was one of those strange phenomena that you can run into about the sure, ocean. Sure, sure. But those are the only two interesting times. Now, was it hot? Very, yeah. The temperature uh, usually ran about, oh, maybe 100 degrees during the average day. Uh, below decks, it was about 130 because that sun beating down on that steel. And then it would, because we, the only place they had any air conditioning was in CIC. Which was the Combat office. Combat Information Center. Mm -hmm. And that was because we had all that radar equipment and we had to maintain a certain temperature. But everything else on that board that ship was not air conditioned. They had blowers, but uh, that, that steel was just like a sponge and it absorbed all that heat. So when you were off duty, was it very uncomfortable to try to sleep or could you sleep on deck? Or? I did a lot of sleeping on deck, yes, at night. Uh, for the most part, I think I might be, probably spent half my time, half my nights on deck. Bring up my mattress from the below decks with the sleeping quarters were second, they were done in the third deck down. So I just rolled it up at night when I was going to be going to, uh, to sleep and I brought it up on deck, pulled a blanket over me, tucked myself in and went to sleep and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. You never, I never had seen, a have seen since the number of stars that are available out in the ocean. It's just spectacular. They never, like Sagan said, there's a billions of stars up there. So it was, it was very idyllic. Uh, once in a while we couldn't, if we were in port, if we were tied up to the dock, we couldn't sleep out on deck because of the maybe complaints from some of the people. And where would you tie up and dock? And for how long? It usually a minimum of about three days, maybe as long as five days. We stopped in Gibraltar, Marseille, Toulon, Nice, Cannes, Villefranche, um, then we went to uh, Naples and Cardinia, uh, Cagliari, Cardinia, Sardinia, um, and we went to Trieste, we went to Venice, we, t we actually tied up in Venice, it was beautiful. Now, these places that you did tie up, were you able to get off ship at that point? And if your section had liberty, yes. Had leave. We didn't have any problem in my office because we had what they call open gangway, which means we were not assigned to any particular liberty section. So we wanted to go ashore, if you will, or go into to the dock or into the city. We were free to do so. There were one, two, there were four of us in that office. Did so we would just take off. Do you remember any special story or special place having gone to all these places? Well, the guy on this camera might have to edit this when I get through. We had a special trip to Rome. It was a three-day trip, and it was uh, offered to us through USO. It cost us you know, some of our money, but we were allowed to go. And then we went first class by train, and the first class European trains are beautiful. You have a cubicle all to yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. So we traveled by train from Rome, to, from Naples to Rome. We got to Rome. They took us to a lovely old hotel, and there was a massive room. It was probably as big as this room in that combined, and ornate furniture. And of course, the first thing we all looked at were the bidets. We, being a very neophyte, never heard what a bit it was, and there were two of them in the bathroom, naturally. So that was hilarious for a while. A bidet? A bidet, if you will, a bidet, yeah. Yes. And the guys had a lot of fun with that for a long time. The room also had a balcony, and uh, we had all stripped down to, we just had our pants on by this time. And we all went on the balcony, and we were standing, it was beautiful. It was just about I guess, one o'clock in the afternoon. And we look across from our hotel, if you will, into the building next door, and there was several women on balconies out there, and they started disrobing. It was a house of ill repute. Uh, you were across the street from a... Yeah. I won't ask if that, anyone took advantage, but... I don't know if they did not know my group. <laughs> we were too busy. But that I thought was hilarious. And again, again being you know, a neophyte, if you will, <laughs> here's the city of Rome, the holy replica of the church, and here are these prostitutes right across the street and probably two blocks down from the... But that's in there, there again, that doesn't make any difference. 
it wouldn't upset anybody today. So did you get, find out ahead of time when you were going to be coming back or? Um... From rumors, yeah, but I finally got a hold of a set of operations orders and I found out that we were leaving, we were uh, rotating, if you will, the fleets and we were going out of Lisbon. So we pulled into Lisbon, Portugal and our relief cruiser pulled in uh, right beside us and we spent about three or four days in Lisbon. Um, and then we took off and we headed for home. And by ship? Yeah, it took about five days. And where did you come into? We came right into Boston for about a month and then we had to have a special mm, political trip down to the city of Baltimore. So they sailed down there for three or four days. And did you, did you join them in that sail yes, also? Yes, we had to. You know, the crew, when the ship sails, unless you're on leave, which means you're out of the area, you've got, you've got to stay with the ship. So when you were coming into Boston, was there a way of notifying your wife and your family that you were coming? They had telephone uh, service. Once we got within uh, about two or 300 miles of Boston, uh, but you didn't have a chance to get to the phone because with all these guys trying to phone home, uh, you didn't get to it. I had written my, to my wife previously before we left Lisbon and I figured out uh, when we might have to stay on board because when you get into Boston, things change a lot. So you have duty sections and my duty section was supposed to be on the day that we pulled in so I didn't figure on getting home that night. Uh, fortunately, one of the other guys stood my watch, if you will, and I was able to get home that night. And then were you able to stay home for that month, or did you have to report to the ship? Oh, no, every day you had to be back on that ship by 08, what they call 08, 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And usually about uh, 3.30 or so, they would, what they have called Liberty Call, and then you could leave to go, to go home again. And how were you transported back and forth to Boston? A cousin of mine worked over on D Street at uh, Felton's at the Pilgrim Run place and he was driving my father back and forth. So I just walk over from the ship over to the, that place on D Street in South Boston I get right home. And then you sailed to Baltimore and as you said this was more political yeah, than anything more, else. It was you know, just because of the name of the ship, get mm -hmm. to the city. They, they had an open house for the people down in Baltimore. They had tours for a couple of days. And were you discharged shortly after that? Yeah, I was discharged in, it was the first or second of October or something. I can't remember the exact date of the, no, I'm gonna throw out the date of October 17th for some reason because that kind of sticks in my mind. I got all kinds of papers that I don't know where the heck they are, but that's about what I remember. But it was October what year? 53. So once discharged, um, and were you the same rank? Yeah, I didn't have time to get any rating change. How, what were your feelings about coming home? Oh, I was delighted, a little bit scared. Uh, I didn't have a job to go to because I was laid off just prior to uh, being recalled so that I wasn't protected under the proviso that the government said if you were called while you were employed, you, get, you had the right to go back to that same job. Uh, but the day I got home, uh, I got out of my uniform, got into my civvies, and I went up to the parts depot up on Route 9, the Ford parts depot, and I get interviewed for a job. Because I'm my, sorry, we went to where? The, the, up here to the, on Route 9 in Natick, the Boston parts depot for Ford Motor Company, which they call now the Beetleback. Okay. That was a parts depot. Okay, Ford yeah. Motor had a dep depot right, had or a depot, depot yeah, right? Yeah, parts depot. And of course, at the time, my wife was pregnant. So my objective was to get a job and a paycheck immediately. And I interviewed with them and they said, okay, well, we have a job that's only good for 30 days. We can't guarantee anything beyond then. I said, I, in this case, I gotta take it. I don't care what it is. So they hired me and I just retired 50 years later. From the same company? Yes. And you had mentioned earlier about um, being indifferent parts of the United States. Yes. Did your job take you to different parts of the United States or was it? Yes. Uh, I probably got close to a half a million to a three quarter of a million miles flying for the company. 
uh, plus all the driving, my territory that I had at various times would go anywhere from Fort Kent, Maine to New London, Connecticut, and New York. And when you retired, what was your title with the company? I was a field service engineer. You had mentioned earlier also about sort of being the consummate student. Talk a little bit about that. You, you... Well, when I joined the company, <coughs> I, mean, I, did, I had gone to uh, Brian Stratton School prior to being called back into the Navy. That was a two-year, like a, a junior college. And um, I had just about ready to enlist, not to enlist, to enroll in college, and then they called me up. So when I got out and got the job, I enrolled in Northeastern University at nights for six years, and I got my degree. And I come up on the stage down at the Boston Garden where they were holding the uh, graduation cap and gown. And I said, thank God, after 18 years, I'm finally getting through school. Very wrong. I never stopped. As soon as I joined Ford Motor Company, well, you have to go for some training. So I'd go a week somewhere or two weeks. And this happened just off for no particular reason. I had engineering training, I had uh, business training, <coughs> I had all sorts of different things. Atlanta, Orlando, Kansas City, uh, Denver, Dearborn, New Jersey, Philadelphia. So when you did all this training, were you off by yourself and your family was back here? Yes, for the most part, until the kids got old enough. And then if I got a, a call to go to a school, I would bring my wife with me. Once, the, once I was sure that the kids were all squared away. And she traveled a lot with me. As a matter of fact, we had, we kind of the other day, and I think it was at one time stressed steadily. We made 12 trips together, and it was all while I was working for the company that she came, she accompanied me. Um, San Diego, Los Angeles, Vancouver, um, Texas, Orlando, Georgia. So when you say a half a million miles, you really did do a lot of traveling, yeah. It seemed like we just spent all of our time in the year. Sure. When you came home, uh, did you join any units of the military reserve or anything like that? No. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, I did not. Why not? The job that I had took me away so much. I spent a lot of time in motels, in hotels, while I was employed by the Ford Motor Company. And I didn't think that I'd be able to devote any time or effort to any kind of an organization other than my church and my family, and that was about it. Did you use or receive any veterans benefits, hospitalization, or the GI Bill for any of your... Um... I used the GI Bill for my uh, training at Northeastern University. And as far as medical, I had spent a couple of weeks up at the Cushing General Hospital when it was a VA hospital. I had and an that's operation. in Framingham. Yep, in Framingham. But other than that, no, I, I haven't had any uh, particular use for uh, government and things. Did you attend, or do you attend any reunions of your old group, your Navy group? Military? Mm -hmm. No. We had a wing ding of a party, the ship's party, when, when we pulled into Boston, and I haven't seen anybody since then. And that was right before discharge? Yeah, shortly before I got separated. We got separated. Separated. Separated, yes. Mm -hmm. And how important to you was serving in the military? Yeah, yes and no. Yes, uh, I got a lot out of it. I was a neophyte when I first went in. I had a little bit of experience the first time. Uh, second time, a little bit more. I was a little, had a little more savvy. Um, so I did a lot of things that perhaps a neophyte wouldn't do on board ship. I knew how to behave myself. I knew how to do things. There are certain things you can do in the military that the military really doesn't, that's sure that you do. I call a guy like myself as a dog robber. 
if somebody's looking for something and they're an officer and it's not available to them, you can figure a way to get that for them without upsetting the applicant or hurting anybody else. And that was something I think that uh, the Navy, being in the Navy, had uh, exposed me to and uh, I had probably used it at times since then. How do you feel, or do you feel, that it affected your future life? How does it affect my future mm -hmm. life? Or if it did? Well, yeah, it, it did to the extent that I had to leave my wife alone for that period of time. Um, would I have done anything differently? Would I be working? Would I have been working for the same company? That's unknown. Uh, so I really can't say that it has had any effect other than <clears throat> the difficulty of only being married for a little over a year and then having to leave. Do you also feel because after the Navy, your job took you away also that your wife became independent? My wife accepted what I had to do. She was very open to that extent. She knew, she knew the kind of a job I had. She understood what it might mean as far as my absence is concerned. And this is with Ford? This is with Ford. Mm -hmm. And it has only been recently that uh, my kids have really come out to say that, yeah, we missed you a lot in the times that you weren't home. I think of the times that I, I might be up in Burlington, Vermont, and there's a snowstorm around here, and my wife is out there shoveling the driveway. Um, she is the rugged type of a gal, and she did it. And then most recently, when they assigned me, just before I got through with the company, after I was only had about three years to go, and they saw fit to assign me to the state of Vermont. And I so I talked with my wife, and she said, you wanted to work until a certain time. You're going to have to do it. So she accepted the fact that there were times that I wouldn't be around. And I might be away for one or two nights a week. Mm -hmm. But it was acceptable to her. I didn't, like, I didn't like it that much. I had a job to do, and of course I'm always, I was always busy, constantly. Um, but it, it came out okay. I'm still a good boy. You mentioned uh, one memorable experience. Are there any others memorable experiences, characters or humorous experiences that you yeah. could share with us? There's one I can share with you. Again, you can edit this one out if you want to. We were, I think, in, I think we were in probably Cannes, and we were anchored out in Cannes. That meant that we had to get on a Liberty boat in order to get to the shore to go walking around and do whatever we wanted to do. And of course, while we're over there on the, on the beach, so to speak, we imbibe in a few bars, several beers. And you had to, the last Liberty boat had to be, to get back on board ship by midnight. So and we all scrambled for that last Liberty boat. And the Liberty boat only holds so many people. It's a pretty good size. It holds about 30 or 40 men. But there were about 50 men who reported for this Liberty boat. So we all got on board and then we're all, Pretty gay, uh, pretty happy. We, we had a good time, and I got on board, but there was no seat for me, so I had to sit on the gunnel. Or if you're in your language, it's the side of the boat, okay? And I'm sitting there with my fanny hanging over the end, and the boat's pretty low in the water. And somebody started doing some funny antics, and we're all laughing. I'm laughing like hell, and I <laughs> went over. Went right overboard. <laughs> And we get back to the ship, and I come up the gangway, and the officer of the deck is standing there, and he looks at me, and he happens to be a guy that I knew, and he said, Mr. Doran, he says, I'm not going to ask you anything at all. You just get below deck, and you get out of that stuff. <laughs> no questions asked. Fortunately, no questions were asked. But it was, everybody got a boot out of it. And of course, they stopped the boat. <laughs> That's really they Thank goodness. Picked me up, all the guys. But that, they were laughing even harder after that. <laughs> So the, the poor guy up on the 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 up at the quarter deck, the officer just could not understand why everybody was in gales of laughter. And well, they were they were even walking up the gangway. They were laughing and laughing. They saw me and he understood why. That's fun. 
Is there anything that we haven't asked or any comments that you would like to make? Yes, um, I had the fortunate experience. I walked, I worked for an import exporter in Boston uh, bef between duties, and during that time, I was fortunate to meet the ambassador f uh, to Spain from France. He was a Frenchman, but he was ambassador to Spain, and his home, his home was in Marseille. And I had a couple of three experiences with him while he was here in Boston. He was doing business with my employer. And then when I got over there to the Mediterranean, I knew where he was. I knew he was in the city of Marseille. So when we pulled into Marseille, I went to a building that was, I remember his address as Bert being 14 or Robert. And I asked for Mr. Henri Romanazzo. And the girl said, just a minute, I'll call him. So, he called me up to his office, and we had a great chat. And Ari uh, owns, I had found out, a, a spire on the Riviera, about 30 miles outside of Marseille, and a hotel and with a restaurant. He says, come on, let's go. So we got in his little Citroen, and we moved her out, and we had a lovely, lovely afternoon, and we conversed back and forth. Um, but the man was so charming, and I never expected to see a French ambassador to, to, to rub noses with, if you will, and uh, it was, he was charming. It was very sad at the end, he told me, and I didn't know at the beginning, but he had just lost his son in a mountain climbing accident. Uh, I had met the son once, he came over with his father, he was a nice fellow, and, but the, 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 Mr. Henri didn't let on anything before this while we were having a, a lovely time at the Riviera. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, but but that was that was an experience that something that you remember. I mean, like you remember the the, the name and the address of, of the building in Marseille, which I think is I, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can remember. You can remember that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything else you'd like to mention before we finish up this oh, interview? Oh, boy, there's so many things that I haven't told you. That I can't. I can't. Uh, I can remember them, but we could be here for hours. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've only got so much tape that you can go through here. Well, we want to thank you, Mr. Richard Doran, for coming in today and sharing a very interesting and somewhat delightful story for us. And we want to thank you also for the service twice that you gave to our country. You have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much.